Hey y'all, movie retrospective time. And here's the one that won the Patreon poll this week by quite a large margin. Sort of a forgotten movie from the 90s. Not yeah. my favorite decade for horror, but this one's, it's not too bad. The thing about this one, it's called The Relic, and it's from 1997. And I was interested to see this one because when I was scrolling through all of the streaming services and I saw that this one was on Hulu, and I remembered that back in the day, like back in maybe like the early 2000s, I read this novel. Because if you guys don't know, this is actually the first of... Um, you know, Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child, they wrote all of those books with that FBI agent, Agent, Prender, agent Prendergast, I think is his name. And he's kind of a recurring character. And all those books, I haven't read all of them, but I read like a, a selection of them and they're actually really good. And this movie is based on uh, the first one that had agent, agent Prendergast in it, even though he is not a character in the movie for whatever reason. So, and then I was thinking to myself, I was like, so I read the book and it was really good. I'm like, wait, did I see this movie? And I was like, you'd think that I would have watched it because I read the book, but I don't think I ever saw it. I think I'm getting it confused with Mimic. Yeah. Um, because that came out, I don't know, I don't remember, but no, it was so like Mimic around was the same older time. Than this. Yeah, a couple years before, I think. And uh, so, and it was kind of like a monster yeah. movie as well. And so I kind of feel like, was that Guillermo del Toro? I want to say it was Guillermo del Toro, but I, I could be know. totally wrong about that. But I remember seeing that one and I read that book too. And I, so I think, so I couldn't remember that this one, I was just kind of like, oh, I saw Mimic. I don't think I saw this one because when I watched this one, I did not remember it. I did, so I don't think I ever saw this one. This is a weird flick. I mean, it, it's a it's a monster movie. Yeah, a higher end monster movie. It sometimes it kind of had a feeling like it was verging on Jurassic Park in a certain way. Yeah. It had CG in it. It was pretty good quality, except for a couple shots. I was like, nah, that's pretty bad. But it was just a weird movie. Um, it could have been a great movie, but as it is because of the edit. It's just, it's just, it's a strange movie. It's, it's, it's okay. Um, it could have been great. It had greatness in it. It was shot beautifully. Had a real good score. The acting was really good. There's something about the edit of this movie, especially the last one third of it, is very muddy. It's the, the edits are so fast and so quick during some of the action se sequences and everything's so dark, you can't really tell what's going on. You start to not care what's happening. It's not real clear what ha what the monster did. But what was interesting was kind of like, it's a detective story too. Yeah. The detective has gotten onto this weird case and you think it might have something to do with voodoo magic and then as it evolves, you realize it has something to do with kind of like genetic mutations and but like really quick ones yeah real real fast <laughs> it's coming out of the amazon jungle you so know? it's like a sci-fi horror yeah. thriller and like yeah. like you said i think a lot of people did kind of compare it to um to jurassic park and actually oh, they the, did well you know not so much but okay, that's it felt well, like it was trying to be well, a little the bit book like the more than anything because okay. like the book a lot of people said that, you know, this is kind of like Michael Crichton for people that don't really like Michael Crichton yeah. books. Because um, I actually, the uh, Preston and Child's books, I actually kind of like those better than Michael Crichton's books uh, for whatever reason. And I especially liked the ones with Agent Prendergast, which I think is really weird because, so they made this movie, which had the FBI agent in it, like I said, who's a recurring character in a lot of their books. And I don't know why they would make an adaptation and leave out what was essentially the main character. Yeah. I mean, yes, um, they have the other uh, licensing, maybe. Well, I don't know, but I, I mean, if they're gonna make if they're gonna make an adaptation, yeah. they have to pay for the rights. So you'd think yeah. that they would want, okay. I, yeah, may, maybe some of the later books, and they're just kind of like, I don't know what the deal was, but it's like Agent Prendergast is such a great character. Um, he's almost kind of like he's this weird like Southern uh, FBI agent, and he's real like uh, he's almost like a vampiric. You know what I mean? Mm. Like he's real scrawny and pale and he's, but he's like a super genius, like Sherlock Holmes or something. And he's just like this really great character. And I don't know why they wouldn't put it in there. Uh, but you know, that's neither here nor there. But what they did do is uh, Tom Sizemore is in this and he's playing, uh, you know, essentially the investigator character, uh, you know. So, so what you have, if you guys haven't seen this movie, is that at the very beginning, you get kind of a prologue where this dude who's like an anthropologist and he's down in Brazil, right? And he's down in Brazil studying some, you know, tribes and they give him this stuff, 
like some kind of drink or something and it makes him like freak out. Kind of like ayahuasca. Yeah, something like that. Like he yeah. starts seeing shit or whatever. And then he's wigging out, um, you know, I have these crates and I have to get them off the ship. Uh, but you don't know why, you know what I mean? So then they kind of go to uh, the Chicago Natural History Museum where they actually did shoot this, at least the exteriors and uh, some of the inside. And uh, these crates have arrived, but the anthropologist, John Whitney, uh, has not arrived. But no one's super worried about it because they figured, oh, he's out in the field. And, you know, we haven't heard from him for a while, but that's not that unusual. So nobody thought anything was weird. So inside these crates, they find, like, one of them has this kind of, like, statue, like an idol type of thing that he had sent that looks kind of like a little monster or whatever. And then the other one doesn't seem to have any. It looks like it just had leaves in it. But they're just kind of like, well, was something packed in the leaves? It was like, maybe not, because it was like nailed shut when it got here. So obviously nobody, like nothing busted out or whatever. So they can't like figure it out. So as it goes on, um, you know that something, like I said, it's a monster movie. So you know that there's a monster loose in this museum, but the people don't know that, right? So people start turning up dead. The first of them is like a security guard, right? Poor dude is like sitting on the john. Uh, enjoying a joint on his break, <laughs> as one does. And uh, an unseen monster pulls him out the thing, pulls his head off, like the cap off a two liter, and uh, sucks his brain out and eats part of it. Yeah. Um, now, initially, they think this is a person doing this. Uh, you know, probably a really big person. This is the problem. This is part of the problem with the movie. It, you don't see this monster very well or clearly at all until the very end and it's too late they should have showed they should have showed you this monster way early in the movie and there should have been a lot more of it but because because of the editing and and, and I maybe budget it comes off as a detective movie that has a monster in the end of it and to me it just didn't work it should have been more like alien well, it's interesting because the director of this, who was Peter Hyams, who's also a cinematographer, so he's like generally the cinematographer in his own movies, he's made a shit ton of movies. He's made, he made 2010. Uh, he did uh, some Steve, uh, not Steven Seagal. He did, I like 2010. Who, yeah, who's good. the other fucker? Uh, Fondam? Yeah, John Claude uh, Van Damme. Yeah. He yeah. did uh, Time Cop. He yeah. did yeah, um, okay. Sudden Death. He did like yeah. some of the other ones. He's done like a lot of big movies. And uh, like I said, he's usually the cinematographer on him. The cinematography on this is really nice, but the main, main complaint that I see with a lot of people, and honestly, I watch a lot of horror channels and a lot of horror dudes uh, actually do like this movie and think it was like underrated, but a lot of them do point out it's really fucking dark and yeah. not dark as in, oh, that's so fucked you up. Can't see. Dark as in you can't see anything. Yeah. Now, what ended up happening with this? Now, that was a deliberate choice by Peter Hyams. He's like, I wanted to make it. He's like, I wanted to kind of explore, you know, the relationship of like the shadow. And he really liked the idea. And he really liked the idea of Alien, where it was just kind of like this really dark and everybody's kind of like that. It's really claustrophobic. And he really wanted to explore that. Now, what I've heard, and I don't know if this is the case, but when it was in playing in the theater, you can actually see it a lot better. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. of just the... You're in a dark theater. But then yeah. when it was uh, transferred to VHS and then to DVD, they didn't color correct it properly. Uh -huh. uh, and so it was too dark. I now, I will say we watched it on Hulu, as I said, and I imagine, I don't know if they would spend like a shit ton of money to restore this because, you know, it did make money, uh, but it wasn't like a massive hit. And I think it's kind of mostly been forgotten about these days. So I don't know if they would have would have like taken the time to brighten it up or you know if, if so if you're gonna watch it it is really really dark and sometimes it's so dark that you can't tell what the fuck is going on but you but you know when i when i was reading something about the director and like what he was trying to do with it i could see what he was trying to do and nobody complained about it when it was in the theater so i'm assuming that that was more like a transfer issue that it was yeah. you know that it just came out too dark when they transferred it but um, yeah, and, and I thought it was all the all the action part of it or the adventure or monster part of it was towards the end of it, and it really yeah. should have been it should have happened a lot faster and over a longer period of time, and I think the monster should have been more of a character in the way that the alien was a character. Yeah, it should have been able to talk or something, or you should have been able to see it and kind of establish a relationship with the audience because. 
for most of the movie, it's just kind of an, a, an idea that there's something bad out there. Yeah, it's like you kind of yeah, see yeah. his claw and you kind of yeah. see like really quick. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's over there in the shadows or whatever. Now, and like I said, that was also a deliberate choice because... Peter Hyams, like I said, he's a big fan of Alien. He's a big fan of Jaws. Uh, and he's a big fan of, like, monster movies like that. And he's like, and I like that you don't see the monster, like, in Jaws or whatever, for a really long time. So that when you do see him at the end, it's, like, a lot more impact. But I think that he did, like, leave it a little bit too long. Because I yeah. will say that the monster in this, which was designed by Stan Winston, looks great. I really, yeah. really like the monster design. I like the way the monster looks. Um, I think it's called a Cathoga. Yeah. Um, it... it Oh, hold on one second. The reason why, because I want to back up and, and address it. In Alien 1, making you wait to see the monster worked in that movie because of the visuals of that movie. Yeah. You already saw the alien spacecraft. You saw the space jockey already. The interior shots of the damn spaceship alone would satisfy you. This is just shots of, of, of Brazil and um, Chicago. So it's not taking you to another world. Right. You got to see something different, you know. Little flashes of things aren't going to be that satisfying in this context. You should have saw that monster early on and done something real creative with it. It's a pretty cool looking monster. It was cooler back in the day. It's like a lizard mixed with a damn... What is it? A like jaguar? A, like a beetle or a something. A beetle and a jaguar and a human or something. It's just weird... Is it has teeth on it? Yeah. It may, I guess those are supposed to be lizard teeth. His head looked like the damn logo from Motorhead. It looked just like that, too. <laughs> with a little bit of beetle mixed into it. On a giant lizard body. It could climb up the walls. It wasn't a bad monster design. Um, the CG on most of the shots of it looked really good, especially for the day. But it would stand up today. The only shots that it, where it kind of sucked is there's a, a shot of it. Two or three times it shows a shot of a woman running and behind her is the damn monster chasing her and it's on fire. Kind of like the Indiana Jones running from the ball. Yeah. Shot. And that thing looks like shit on fire. It doesn't it looks it looks fake as fuck. Now it 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 burned for a long time, kinda inexplicably. Maybe it was because it was covered in chemicals. Yeah, I think that was yeah, right. she had like made kind of Cut, like a right. Molotov cocktail type of thing with yeah. all the uh and it didn't seem to react Museum to fire too much. Chemicals. It didn't care that it was on fire. It was just kind of weird. Well, you know what, too, is that whole end sequence with the monster chasing her and then her getting in the tank and then the monster blowing it up everything. Yeah. That was actually not in the original script. What ended up happening, this movie was actually supposed to come out before it came out, like a year before or a few months before. It was supposed to come out in 1996. But they showed it to audiences, and the audiences liked it, but they were just kind of like, well, we, the end needs more pizzazz. They need, like, they yeah. need more, more, some big explosion. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, they're, because what they said, they said, we want everybody to, like, cheer when the monster dies. Like, whoa, they got him, or whatever. Yeah. And there's, like, so at the end, she just kind of, like, sets it on fire, and then she gets away, and it ends. Um, but so the audiences were just kind of like, oh, okay. So they're like, okay, well, how about we make it so it chases her a little bit more and it's on fire and then it explodes. And then the audience, test audiences seem to like that better. So, but that, so that wasn't the original ending. That was actually put on after the test audiences wanted a more, like a bigger ending. I remember how things went. This movie was made for an audience that kind of came out of the 80s and then went through the 90s and they're still alive today. Hollywood had a hard time, still to this day has a hard time selling movies to certain generations because the generation was maturing along with Hollywood. And things would kind of get old, you know. During the time the 90s had rolled around, the 80s action movie um, template was pretty stale. So they had to come up with new stuff to satisfy that audience. In the 90s, the idea of an, off, uh, of a, of an audience, I think, going, wow, they got the monster and shit... The audience was already older and kind of jaded by that time. You're never going to have that same reaction like when they blew up Jaws. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was a little kid in the theater. They fucking blew up the Jaws. <laughs> and people were, yeah. They blew up the Jaws. <laughs> it's because, you know, it was a more, it was simpler times, you know. It wasn't competing against video games and YouTube and everything. It's just. Yeah, everyone's just such a cynical bastard Everyone's nowadays. very cynical about it. <laughs> imagery does not make an impact. 
on people too much anymore. They've seen everything. Seeing fucking fantastic imagery even on your phone was something that was just undreamed of even in the 90s. They were just, you know. So, really the only thing that's effective nowadays is story. And it's real hard to have millions of movies coming out of Hollywood or thousands of them per year and all of them having excellent stories. They just can't generate it, you know. Yeah, and the, the talent isn't there. Well, yeah, and like You'll I said, it's, few, it's always kind of like that. And like yeah. I said, this this movie, it's not a bad movie by any stretch of the imagination. It's pretty entertaining. Um, it got so-so reviews when it came out. Like, uh, Siskel and Ebert really liked it for some reason. They just said, yeah, it was really entertaining. One thing that I will give it props for is that I feel like in the 90s, you know, there was a lot of horror movies that came out. There were some R-rated ones, but they were mostly aimed toward teenagers. This one was still R-rated, and it's actually pretty gory. You did get to see the monster, like, pull a dude's head off, and it's like there's brains and gore and stuff like that. Um, and the fact that they made an R-rated horror movie with adult characters, like, in an actual, like, adult job. Like, it was in a museum, and it was all had to do with, like, you know, there was some museum intrigue, like people trying to get grants and stuff that was kind of going on in the background. And then it kind of had like the scientific uh, thing of where the monster came from. And it was like mutating really fast. You know what I mean? I guess it started out really small because yeah. she found that one thing. And then she found out it was like had this much DNA from a lizard and this much, or it was a gecko and this much DNA from like a certain kind of beetle. And, and then a they, person. And then they found out that it was like, yeah. that was kind of like the big uh, reveal at the end was that it actually had 40 something percent human DNA. Yeah. Um, and then you find out that the, the anthropologist at the beginning of the movie, he was freaking out about the crates, John Whitney. Um, I guess he had sort of like genetically like evolved into this monster or he had like somehow yeah, it was taking his not DNA that clear. or whatever. Yeah, it, it probably is clear if you go back and rewatch it and pay a lot of attention. But I don't think the average person in the audience back then would have really given a shit enough to really figure that part of it out. They're just like, yeah, okay. I remember we just fucking accepted shit. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, a lot of the science, and especially okay. if you're watching like just a fun monster movie yeah. that has science fiction, it's just you can go with a little bit of hand wavy kind of. Right, yeah, yeah, that sounds reasonable enough. Right. You know what I mean? As long as it's not so outlandish yeah. that it like takes you out of the story. I think I think part of the re- part of the strength of the movie also kind of was part of its downfall, and I think you mentioned it. It was adults doing an adult jobs. It was supposed to be very believable, and and grounded in reality. Which that kind of took away some of the fucking fantasy that you could have gone with. You could have made this a lot wilder and probably a lot more entertaining if you didn't try to keep it grounded in reality constantly. Like imagine if this was an Arnold Schwarzenegger style action movie like Predator. Or even though that was pretty grounded in reality in certain ways. Or just something like Running Man where you're just fighting a monster. Yeah. You could do some funny shit and, you know, have big epic scenes and it really does you know it's just fun to watch you could that would probably have got a better response from the audience you know having gone through the 90s i did not see this movie in the 90s i didn't either but had you asked me had i seen them back then and you asked me which one was better this one or mimic i'd have said mimic was better I think that's the, pretty much the consensus. Yeah. I mean, I saw Mimic a long time ago, but I remember that one being like pretty decent. Yeah, even I didn't though, see this one at the even time. Even though this one has a bigger scope. It has a much bigger scope and it felt like it had a bigger budget. And visually, it was probably more I- impressive. This wouldn't have stuck with me. Mimic kind of did for a while. Yeah. Some of the ideas behind Mimic. A human-sized damn cockroach that could pretend to be a human. That's fucking. That was something that was kind of intriguing. Yeah, that's fucked up. That kind of. That's that, like my worst nightmare. That idea was kind of intriguing <laughs> to me, especially when I didn't know what it was when I was first watching it. It looked like some kind of spooky man, but it <laughs> turned out it was just really a carapace of a fucking roach, a gigantic cockroach. At which point I would have yeah. just been like, no. It was just impersonating a human. A roach that can impersonate a human. That's yeah. like horrifying. It couldn't talk, but you see. It, they they reveal that this thing is like 40% human DNA. Man, that gave you license right there to make it talk. It could have talked later because yeah. I think the whole thing, I think it was evolving yeah. throughout the course of the movie. Had it talked, it could have been uh, um, a character. And then you could have done some shit like, I don't know, something like maybe Out of the Keep. Remember that movie, The Keep? We're going to have to review that. Yeah, I had, had to get a good copy I of The like Keep. I like that movie. I haven't seen it in forever. I was looking for it on a streaming service the other day, but I couldn't find one. I couldn't find it. Eventually, you find the damn monster, and it's like a Jewish golem or something. Wasn't it a golem? Or it was yeah, some I kind thought of, it was something like something that. Something like right? that, and it could talk. I haven't seen that for a while. And it was, it was hell-bent on getting vent, killing off all the Nazis. It was pretty cool. And it could talk. 
that fucking added a whole new dimension to it. I mean, you and, got well. I mean, you really got it. That's treading a fine line when yeah. you're having a monster that talks. Yeah. I mean, depending on what kind of monster, you'd have it to is. know how to play it right because it yeah. was only forty percent human. So it it would have been talking, but its motivations would have been inhuman. It would yeah. have wanted inhuman type stuff, and its thinking would have been kind of inhuman. Which that would have you could have fun writing dialogue for that. I remember, like I said, I I read the book of this a long time ago. And I remember liking the book a lot because I really, really like books that are set in museums. And I really like particularly horror that's set in museums because a museum is like kind of inherently creepy anyway. Um, and I love that actually, well, Peter Hyams, uh, you know, he didn't write the book, obviously, but he was excited to do this adaptation because he grew up across the street from the uh, Natural History Museum in New York. And he always had like recurring nightmares about being being locked in there overnight and like the big squid, you know, if you've been been there and you see the big squid and the whale thing that up, up on the ceiling and like of that attacking him and stuff. So he was really excited to do this book because he's like, oh, it's like my worst nightmare and it'll be really awesome. But I just, um, I don't know. It's it just kind of, the book was really good, but I feel like, and I like the concept of the monster that kind of comes there in the crate and then they don't really know what it is exactly. And then it's, you know, it's kind of evolving over the course of the thing. Yeah. And I like, and I respect the decision that he had. He's like, I want to make this like really dark and shadowy. That's cool. Um, you know, I want to make it so you don't see the monster that much because it'll have more impact at the end, which I think is a good idea generally. Um, I just think he waited too long on this one. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, the monster actually does look cool. And I really like that they, that they didn't shy away from the gore. I mean, like I said, they actually do show people's yeah. heads getting pulled off. And, you know, it's, so it is like a fairly gory, like horror movie, com which is nice because a lot of them, yeah. you know, they try to stick to PG-13, which is lame. Com compared to other, this is a mutant monster movie. Yeah. Compared to other mutant monster movies like Prophecy or something, it's, all, it's, it's, it's head and shoulders above that. Yeah. But when it comes to like, and I would say Mimic is another mutant monster movie. Mimic, I would say, is a little bit better. Yeah. Um, the best m mutant monster movie that I could recommend was one called Splice. That's how I would do it. Remember, wasn't it called Splice? Was that the one where the guy where where they, they have the daughter the, and the yeah. thing and, and Adrian Brody fucks, fucks the daughter alien whatever? It's not a daughter and it's not an alien. It's, or it's not an alien, but it's a movie. yeah. It they worked at some kind. Of, I got to see it again. I need to get a good copy of it. But I thought I thought it was a fucking badass idea. It was some people that worked at a genetic lab. And a guy kind of, I think they did want a child at first, but they just made one. It was mostly human, but not really. It had a bunch of other stuff. I think it had some insect stuff and some plant DNA and everything yeah, all mixed I into kinda, it. I've only seen it once, but and they it brought it back. Bit. It looked like a human girl, kind of, but it grew to adulthood real f quickly. And didn't it change into a male at some point? Yeah, yeah. and there's a reason why that had, it was, because it, it it was, I think that had something to do with it. Wasn't it part mollusk or something where it, it was something that could change sex under certain... Which some fish and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, it, it, it was bizarre. They bring it back, it kind of looks a little bit like an alien, but it was female. It was kind of sexy. Turns out later he was having sex with it, but it was, it was real friendly. You know, and it wasn't human. And he fucked it over and it got pissed and turned into a male. And it was fucking deadly as a male to try to get revenge on him for breaking its heart. I guess it'd be a good way to describe it. <laughs> it got jealous over his girlfriend, over his wife. Yeah. And so it was two females competing for a while. It was good. It was good. That that one, because that was, that was a mutant movie that it seemed kind of plausible. And it was kind of scary because... It was a monster, but it was it was cute, and he had sex with it. That that which that is, concept which is right pretty th weird. Yeah, <laughs> that's a pretty weird concept. Well, not a lot of movies would go there. Yeah, I he have had to sex like with say. it. Yeah, and it fell in love with him. <laughs> yeah, and then it got pissed. That's you like know, some, that's like some which that, well, it was mostly shit. human, I think, but it had a bunch of other stuff it mixed in with it. And they weren't, and they did it illegally. Nobody's supposed to know that they had it. Well, yeah, it's a little unethical. Yeah, and they were hiding it out in a shack, and it became a teenager just in a couple of weeks. Remember, it was doing yeah. stuff a teenage girl would do, and getting yeah. pissed. It got pissed, and it made a move on the dude, and he he's like, "All right, we let's get it on." <laughs> you know, whatever. And, yeah, and that came back and bite him in the ass. Yeah, well, that was a good movie. It just seemed a lot more plausible because I think a dude would do that. 
Oh yeah, I'm sure. That, yeah, I'm sure most of them would. Yeah. <laughs> well, it had agency. Yeah. You know, so he's he's just like, okay, I guess it is a woman. So he's he's that's close a, enough. Close enough. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> it's weird. Well, it probably could have gone the other way around if it was a woman and she made a male creature like that. If that motherfucker was hot, she'd probably let it hit. And that's and then. What kind of child would you have? You see, this is the crazy shit that really should be in these kind of sci-fi movies. It should just kind of tread on the edge of fucking, of fucking, you know, of morality, you know. Well, like I said, yeah. that was like some like well, like a couple years back, uh, Guillermo del Toro made Shape of Water, which is about a woman having sex with a fish man. Okay, so. yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, like that. That might happen. What comes out? A bunch of tadpoles. <laughs> And then what are the tadpoles? Would be much easier than human babies. Yeah, and then what do the tadpoles do? Yeah. Do you keep them in a fish tank? Do they get out? What happens to them when they grow big? What do they eat? Do they start making moves on humans? Do they become like humanoids from the deep? See, that's some scary shit that we feel like we need to ask ourselves. (laughs) That's the way I'm thinking about it, you know. Yeah. Animal kingdom stuff, and you're you're just another one of the animals in the kingdom. Yeah, well, sure. They're they're bringing you down to that level. Yeah. Well, yeah. So so when you put it that way. You know, a movie like this, which is just like, like you said, it's basically just a standard monster movie. Yeah, it's a standard monster movie. Um, you know, yeah, they've, you know, they introduce the concept of like this really, really quick evolution, which right. is a good concept, but they don't do a great deal with it, I nah, guess. yeah. There was no sex. It was part man. Yeah. So where's the sexual angle? And he was, it, and, and the thing about it, it can't it was even talk. what it ate, yeah. it, the reason why it was pulling everyone, like popping everyone's heads off was because it ate like straight out of your hypothalamus. Yeah. Um. So it would have to pop your head off and then it would like, it would like yeah. suck your brain out or whatever. And then it would just like leave the brain there like a fucking empty Capri Sun. I mean, there was one, there was one scene where it runs up on a, on a, on a good looking woman and it considers. It licks her. Licks her and like, <laughs> and then is it going to kill her because it had killed a bunch of other people and it killed some dogs and it didn't kill her. But come on, man, that's a cop out. Well, I thought for a second because <clears throat> I didn't know if it was like it didn't kill her because this was at the end. It was Penelope Ann Miller's character who was kind of like the main character. Her name so uh, she's all th- she's a biologist, I think, and uh, she, her name's Margot Green. And so I didn't know if the monster didn't kill her just because it was the end and she had to be the hero and kill it, or if it, or if the human part of that remembered her. Yeah, but because that's, when it was a dude, it knew who she was. That's what I'm getting at. Right. They even knew all the way back in the 20s. Was that the 20s or 30s? That King Kong. King Kong was after the women. Yeah. See, there was the the idea that the monster is after the the, the, the humans for sexual or romantic purposes. That adds to the fucking to the to to the to the horror. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they, he just walked away from that. He just, That fucking monster should have said, I'm going to mate with this and take it. <laughs> that goes all the way back, man. That goes all the way back to humanoids from the deep, King Kong. Shit, that goes back to all of them, you know? It does, yeah. Yeah. Which and then they even reversed it with Mighty Joe Young. Mighty Joe Young was the good King Kong, and he had a human girlfriend. Remember that? Get him, Mighty Joe. And you kind of know what the hell is this? What's going on between this woman and this and this and this gorilla? You know, just there's. I'm telling you, know, there's a whole subgenre that, of porn. Yeah, what's going on with this? Why is this? Why is this woman love this gorilla so much? You know, <laughs> he's the hero because you know? he doesn't talk back. He doesn't talk back. <laughs> yeah, See, it makes why. you wonder. You know, but. <laughs> I'm just fucking around. Because he's big. But, well, I mean, because yeah. gorillas are kind of like big, but they're also sort of gentle. Yeah, yeah. Fuck with them so, too much. You know. And like I said, they can't yeah. talk, so that's, hey, that's always a plus. <laughs> they, got a, they got a young male gorilla down in the Tokyo Zoo that has all a huge fan base and nothing but these Japanese girls fucking sending him love letters and taking pictures of him and saying he's the most handsome gorilla in the world and shit. He's <laughs> standing there fucking showing off. He knows he's fucking, he knows that those Japanese oh, girls were, were loving on him. He's sitting absolutely. there just trying to be as handsome as he possibly can. And <laughs> He's like pretend, Yeah, just basking in it. Basking in glory. <laughs> they got whole things on YouTube about that damn Tokyo's most hand Japan's most handsome gorilla. What's that gorilla's name? I can't remember what his name is now. Uh, but yeah, so so like I said, if you didn't see it, I think the best things about this movie, I, li- I really like the monster design, which like I said was Stan Winston. Mostly practical effects, especially when you see them close up. <laughs> Uh, when the movie, when the monster is like running around at CGI, but actually the CGI even for 1997 actually looks really decent, except for the end when it's on fire and running, and then it looks super fake. Um, so you know, that's that's kind of 
not the not technology anymore. wasn't ready yet. They it wasn't yet. Yeah, it was, they it shouldn't was have just done that. The '90s, and yeah. well, like I said, that was tacked on later because yeah. you know the end wasn't explosive enough. Right. Um, I really like uh, Tom Sizemore in this as uh, the lieutenant or whatever, like the in detective uh, Degosta, I think his name is. He's really good in it. Uh, Clayton Roner is in this, which I always like to see him. He's not in enough movies. He was in April Fool's Day and some other uh, horror movies back in the day, and I always like uh, seeing him in there. He doesn't have a huge part, but he's good in it. Um, um, you know, it's, I just feel like there's a good movie in here somewhere. It's it's just, it's dark. It's hard to tell what's going on in the last third when the monster is chasing everybody through this closed down museum. Um, and, you know, the, you can't, and the, and the edit is so quick that a lot of times you can't really tell what's happening. Um, so that's kind of like a little bit, but it's totally worth watching, especially if you liked the novel. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't know why they left Agent Prendergast out because he's like the main character in the book and he's like a really good character, but whatever. It's, you know what I mean? I didn't know, like they could have started a whole franchise with that dude because they've, because uh, what's their faces? Like they wrote like a whole bunch of books with that character and the, the ones I've read are actually really good. So I don't know why they haven't like adapted those yet, but whatever. But yeah, it's on uh, Hulu at the moment if you want to watch it. It might be on some other streaming services as well. You know, it's not fantastic, but it's like decent. It's worth watching if you like uh, monster movies. So, you know, I guess that uh, will do it for this movie retrospective. And we will see you guys on the next one. Bye.